Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is session 12 of our uh, Forerunner School class, Understanding the Forerunner Call. And uh, uh, it's a bit amazing to me how fast it's gone by as we uh, started this uh, uh, probably three months ago or so. And now we're at the end of the session, end of the class. This is the last session of the uh, of the class. And I uh, just want to say how much I appreciate your involvement in it and just the encouraging uh, texts and emails and uh, words of encouragement you've given to us in terms of how much this class is uh, making a difference in your life and how much you're enjoying it. It's really an encouragement to me um, and I pray that it will have a lasting impact upon your life. Uh, it's certainly a uh, an important issue is certainly a timely issue in the, where we are as a in the world, really, where we are in America for sure, and where we are in the world. God needs forerunners right now who will uh, partner with Him as friends of the bridegroom and as those who will be His partner, be uh, used of Him to to raise up the church, to speak into the church in the urgent uh, the urgency of the hour. So much of the church is right now just uh, in compromise and very ignorant of what the world is on the precipice of entering into. And God is raising up forerunners. So I'm thankful for you that you have chosen to come this far in terms of watching the videos, reading the notes, studying and being a part of the forerunner school, entering into our group discussions. Uh, uh, it's very, very uh, encouraging to me and I think very timely. And I think it's very pleasing to the Lord because he really... The timing is such that he really does want to raise up a company of forerunners uh, in this hour. So uh, I want to just encourage you not to just forget this as we go. Go back and, and uh, meditate on these various topics. And of course, a lot of the other classes in the forerunner school will address in more detail things that we just were able to touch on uh, in this class. We're just we're trying to lay a framework really for what the forerunner call is in this class. And then we will drill into it, into various topics of it in other classes uh, uh, that we have. In fact, the next class will be understanding the end times, which is very a very important idea, a very important concept as it relates to forerunners, because we're talking about preparing a people uh, in accordance with God's eternal purpose. Uh, and that will activate the, the shift to the age to come. When that is done, that is made, that it, that occurs, and so end times are very important upon it. So you know, we'll build on a lot of these different issues, but the forerunner understanding the forerunner call lays the foundation for this, and uh, I am excited that you have taken it very, very seriously. So I want to start with prayer, and then we want to continue to talk about the journey of the forerunner. Uh, in this session, we will look at. We'll continue to look at the preparation, the journey of preparation, but then we'll also make a shift and then we'll go from there uh, into a little bit about the journey of ministry and both are in, important. We've talked a lot about ministry, so we'll emphasize really preparation, but we do want to touch on that uh, as, we, as we end uh, the class. So let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, and ask him to teach us, be, be our teacher. Uh, we do pray that, Father. We just pray, Father, in the name of Jesus that you come, that you take control. Uh, I confess that I am unable to do anything apart from you. But Lord, through me, you can bear much fruit and you can bear fruit that remains. And so I ask for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to be strong, to be powerful, uh, to uh, give us revelation knowledge of what you want to say, but also impartation, Father. We ask for impartation of uh, just that call as a forerunner to be released upon us in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Uh, let me just do a little bit of review from the last session. You know, in the last session, we talked totally about the preparation of the forerunner. And we did, basically, we talked about four things, four aspects. We talked about the need for preparation. Uh, and I really emphasize that it's absolutely mandatory if you really want to be a forerunner, I mean, if you just want to go through the material and, uh, you know, have a little bit of understanding of it, that's different. But if you really want to be a forerunner, be, to be used as, by God as a forerunner in this hour, this hour of history, 
then there really is, absolutely is a need for serious preparation on your part. Uh, so we've talked about, talked about that. And then we talked about the difference between being called and being commissioned. Uh, and that many are called, but few are chosen. And there's a preparation period between the, the being called and being commissioned. <clears throat> and so uh, you're you, probably for most of us right now, we've been called you, or you wouldn't be this far in the class, but there's still a preparation process that is required before you can actually be commissioned by the Lord to, to, for him to say that your character is such and your message is such that God can trust you to go out and to be his voice. And so that's a, that may take a relatively brief amount of time or it may take a more time. It depends on where you are, but it's absolutely necessary. Then we talked about the need for complete surrender to the Lord first, but also to the call. Uh, and the point there is that before God will really take you through an intense time of preparation, a detailed time of preparation, you've got to really surrender to this call. Remember we talked about where Elisha left the plows and left his feet in the field to follow after and minister to Elijah. Well, he had completely surrendered to it, but that took place at the time of the call, not so much at the time of the commissioning. And so there's a real need if you really want to be, if you really want to be serious with God and say, Lord, prepare me to be this forerunner, there needs to be a, a real deep surrender to this call. Uh, and so uh, that was an important aspect of the last session. And then we talked about the call outside the camp where Elijah was called outside the camp and Paul was called outside the camp. Elisha was called outside the camp uh, and John the Baptist was called outside the camp. In fact, his entire ministry was outside the camp. And you, there was a need to go outside the camp. And we, we talked about it from two purposes. I want to make sure you understand this. First, the first purpose, called outside of the camp to be prepared. You're going to have to call, come out of the system if you really want God to prepare you. Now, that doesn't mean you have to leave your denomination or you have to leave the, your being under a particular bishop or whatever your structure is. But you have to come out from those things that hinder you from being prepared. Uh, and then the second aspect of it, so the first aspect, you come outside the camp to be prepared. But secondly, you have to come outside the camp in order to minister back into the system. You cannot have one foot in the system and one foot uh, outside the system and then minister into it. it your, your message will not be effective. Now, again, I'm not saying you have to leave your denomination or your church or any of those things, but you have to be free to be a voice. If you're going to be a forerunner voice, we must be free to be a voice into uh, the system, whatever that uh, may be. So we talked about that time outside the camp. Uh, and really all these are fit together. We, we are, uh, we're, caught, we're called and we go outside the camp. Complete surrender is necessary uh, in order to do that, uh, to be prepared to t for God to take us outside the camp. Uh, and then we're commissioned when that season outside the camp of preparation, not necessarily outside the camp of ministry, but outside the camp of preparation uh, is completed. And so we, we basically the last session focused on the need for preparation and, all, and what's involved in that. And now we want to drill a little bit into this time outside the camp. We want to look at uh, what is transpiring in the lives of Elijah and others at when they are outside the camp so that we can see what God wants to do and accomplish in our time outside uh, the camp. Uh, so that's where we we'll start out. We're talking about, uh, the, again, the work of preparation. And I've titled this first sex, session, section in this session, A Hidden Work of preparation. So let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, I want to look, we want to look, just uh, read this scripture and then we'll look into uh, some of these issues that it relates to Elijah's time outside the camp. You know, in verse 1 of 17, we know that Elijah prophesied that there would be a drought coming upon the land until his word 
uh, came uh, back to end the drought. So at, the, at that time, right after that, starting with verse two of 1 Kings 17, uh, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself. That's the key, the key word, hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. And it shall be that you shall drink of the brook. See, when he went there, he was to drink of the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he would drink uh, from the brook. And so that was his time at Brook Cherith. What did the Lord do? He said, okay, you've given this word. Now I'm going to hide you for a season uh, and I'm going to take you by uh, the Brook Cherith, which was uh, outside the camp. And I'm going to do two things while there. I'm going to cause you to drink of the brook and I'm going to feed you from heaven, uh, both bread and meat. Now the ravens uh, fed him, uh, but he didn't eat raven meat. They brought bread and they brought meat twice a day for him. A very, you know, in and of itself, a very supernatural uh, thing. Um, and so God was taking him with a particular purpose uh, about uh, that. Now let's try to understand it a little bit better. Let's look first at what the meaning of the word cherith uh, means. It's a Hebrew word. Uh, and it means basically cutting, cutting or separation. It means to cut or to separate. Uh, it comes from the root of a Hebrew verb, karat. And I'm sure I'm not pronouncing this uh, correctly, uh, but karat, which the website, Abram Publications, which is a Hebrew website, it describes the, this word cherith, or karat and cherith as this. Uh, cutting off, it means to cut off of what? was first rounded up and isolated. So there was an idea of rounding up something, isolating it, and then using that time or that function to cut off. The word may simply describe a cutting down of a tree, but it also describes the cutting of a covenant. In addition, it also describes the social principle by which weaker members of society are isolated and driven out often to be adopted by another society, which many times elevates these rejects to an elite class. Uh, and so in, in a way, this is what happened with Elijah. Uh, God rounded him up, said, go out, I'm gonna hide you for a while. Uh, I'm gonna cut away and separate you from all kinds of things, cut these things off of you, and then I'm gonna elevate you uh, with a greater anointing and greater authority to be used as my messenger and my builder. Uh, and so that's what God wants to do with us as well at our time at Brook Cherith is to do uh, all of those things. So uh, God wants to take us into there and, and to feed us and to cut, us, cut away these things and to empower us to be used in greater authority. Now, I want to make this really clear. I and mean, this is in your notes. I want to make sure when, when I was called out, I, uh, the Lord began to call me out of the of the camp, really almost from the very t beginning of the time that we started our church in 1991, but especially when he began to call us as a forerunner, he called us outside uh, of the camp. Uh, and so there was a, a season for me of probably about, uh, I mean, the season of preparation and de dealings of God lasted a lot longer than this, but the time of preparation for the forerunner before I was commissioned in any form or fashion probably was three or four years or so. And so what the Lord did, he pulled me out uh, of what I would call significant ministry uh, in order to prepare me. But I want to make sure we understand because I don't want you to just like put in your letter, if you're a pastor, put in your letter of resignation to your church and say, I've got to go into the wilderness for three or four years. While God was working on me, I was still pastoring the church that we had started. I was still doing that and God was giving me a lot of revelation during that time period and I was feeding our church. And so I was doing uh, a, a lot of ministry locally 
but I had, yet, had not yet been commissioned to go beyond the walls of our church uh, into the nations where God uh, eventually opened up uh, to me and, and others in our fellowship uh, to be forerunners in that way. I had not yet been commissioned as that. So anyway, I want to just make sure I'm clear on that because I don't, I, want, I don't want anybody to listen to this uh, and say, I got to go uh, leave my denomination. Be obedient to the Lord. Hear his voice and be obedient to him. But I was still doing ministry in our church, uh, but it wasn't the fullness of commi being commissioned uh, as a forerunner. So anyway, I just want to make that a point. But now let's look at, while we're still here at Brook Cherith, let's find out what God did in Elijah and wants to do in us uh, at, that, at our time at Brook Cherith. Uh, the Lord will separate you un unto him to produce a growing union uh, with Christ. Uh, he wants to, more than anything, he wants to separate you to work in you. Uh, see, I mean, the, the basic principle, I mean, he wants this because of our relationship with him, just as a general principle. He wants to work in us to draw us closer into oneness with him. Obviously, he wants to do that. But also to be a forerunner, it's really critical to be a forerunner that we are on the same journey that we are speaking into the lives of other people. In other words, we cannot be a voice into the church, turn to Christ, build a relationship with him, uh, go, become intimate with him, draw close to him in union, full union. We cannot be that voice and then we're not even pursuing that ourselves. What Jesus would call that a hypocrite. Uh, and, and we would be hypocritical if we did that. And so the Lord takes you to Brook Cherith in your season to build at least the beginnings of that in, intimate relationship with him. Now it won't last, I mean, he, he won't be fully complete with that work while you're there. It'll, it's a lifetime thing if we're growing in that, but he wants to really create that initial framework or that ability uh, to, to be in union with him. Uh, now, remember from some of our other sessions, union is a function of intimacy and image, being intimate with Christ and being conformed into his image. And we'll look at image when we get to the point of talking about what God did in Elijah at Zarephath, but intimacy is a key, key uh, issue there. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he wants to draw us into, into intimacy with him. You know, we talked about this in session 10, and there's, some, there's a section of that in your notes. I won't take the time to read that, but uh, when we're born again, our spirit is, it becomes one with God's spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians tells us that. So we're one in spirit, but God wants us to be in union, one, not only in spirit, but also in soul and in body and our actions. And so there's a process of drawing us closer and closer together that we might be in one, one with him, not only in spirit, but also in soul, which is our mind, our will, our emotions, our thought processes and our motives and all of that, as well as our actions and uh, uh, all the, the cravings and all the things that are, are involved uh, there. Uh, so part of what he wants to do at Brook Cherith is he wants to produce that union, a greater union, greater intimacy uh, with the Lord. And, there, and then there's uh, two things really that, that I wanna talk about that take place there. First one, and it's in your notes on page three, uh, at Brook Cherith, the Holy Spirit will do a deep work of cutting away the old and healing of issues from the past in the lives of forerunners. He wants to cut away, remember the meaning of the word Cherith is cut, separate and cut. Uh, and so he wants to cut away the old and healing of the, of, of the issues from the past. <coughs> Excuse me. Remember it said it, it, that to, it, God said to Elijah, there at Brook Cherith, you will drink of the brook uh, and water, and, you know, brook is water. And, and so 
water and streams and rivers often speak of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in John chapter seven, Jesus talked about uh, rivers of living water. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water, living water, water, river. Um, but this he spoke of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive. And so there are a lot of other scriptures that you could draw from. But the principle is that when God speaks about water and rivers and all that, a lot of times the symbolism of that is that he is talking uh, about uh, the Holy Spirit. So there's a work of the Holy Spirit that God wants to do while you're at Brook Cherith. There's a work of the Holy Spirit that he wants to do in your life uh, to produce a, a cutting away of the old and healing uh, of the issues. Uh, even if you think about uh, the Israelites going into the promised land, they were circumcised, cut away the flesh, and then they had to stay there in Gilgal until they were healed before they could go and produce the land and, so there's a, and take the land. So there's a lot uh, there. And so God wants to do a lot of that. He wants to, do, to cut away uh, things in your life. He wants to cut away hurts and he wants to cut away areas of demonization. He wants to cut away uh, just a lot of issues uh, from your past. Um, give you, I'll just give you an example just so we make help us to understand. Uh, there was a lady in our church, this, is, this was years and years ago. There was a lady who came to our church uh, and she was uh, one broken young lady. Um, she had been radically abused by her husband uh, and uh, even prior to that. Uh, and she had very, very low self-esteem. She felt shame and guilt, uh, condemnation and all sorts of issues because of the way uh, she had been treated. Now, she had a heart for God, but uh, she was, you could just see it in her countenance. She was really weak and broken and she came to our church. The Lord brought her to our church and she was there for uh, two or three years. I don't remember exactly how long. Uh, and at that season in our church, we had an altar call pretty much every week and there was a lot of ministry that was going on in our, uh, in our church. And so she would come forward for ministry week after week after week. And we would lay hands upon her and pray for her for a variety of issues. Uh, there was deliverance that took place and a lot of other things, he, inner healing from hurts and all of that. And then a few years later, the Lord brought a, a man into her life uh, and she was married and they moved away. He took a job in another city and they moved away. Uh, but uh, we saw, you saw, you saw her countenance increase and improve over this number of year period. It very subtle, very gradual. But at the end of that, she was ready for marriage. She was ready to take, uh, uh, to, to be a wife who could love her husband. And, uh, and so, I mean, this was not related to the forerunner call, but it, it, may, it shows you the point of what God wants to do. There are many people who God has called as forerunners who need a deep work, deep work to go free from issues of, of sin and self and areas of demonization uh, to, be, to be prepared. Uh, they need a work of the Holy Spirit. They need that river of life to cut away all the old. And so many others have, uh, of us have been in deep in sin before we came to the Lord. And there's scars of that and, and tentacles of that that are still there. And we need to go free uh, from all of that. So God will take you through a season there. In fact, he's, he's taken uh, pretty much our whole church uh, th through a variety of seasons of cutting away all the old and all the things that are hindering us and would hinder us uh, from being that forerunner. So that's part of what he wants to do when he takes you outside the camp to Brook Cherith for that uh, season. The second thing he wants to do is he wants to fill you with biblical truths needed to communicate the forerunner message. Very important. If we're going to be a voice, we've got to have a message to speak. We've got to know the message. We've got to own it. We've got to be living it uh, so that we can proclaim it. We've got to live uh, that out. 
Uh, you know, we're going back to Elijah's time at Brook Cherith, it says that the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. Every day, twice a day, God began to, uh, to feed him. Uh, feed him. And of course, we're talk he's talking natural sustenance, and that certainly is important. But symbolizing this, Bread and meat talk about the scriptures. They talk about God's voice. You know, Jesus said, you don't live, live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Uh, and then Paul, when he was speaking to the Corinthians, he said, you know, I want to give you the meat of the word, but I can't because you're not ready for it. I have to give you the milk uh, of the word. And so bread and meat symbolize scriptures the, the, the revelation of the scriptures. And remember, he was, the ravens fed him. And so what was he doing? He was fed from heaven. The ravens came from the air. They, so the heaven, heavenly revelation came, the scriptures, but not only just the scriptures, the meat of the word, the, the deeper word. And so that's what God wants to do. I mean, most people that are going to be called as forerunners have a fairly significant understanding of the foundational scriptures. Uh, you know, you were, you, most likely you were born again a number of years ago and you know a lot of the foundational principles of the scriptures. Uh, so you have the word, but you may not have the meat of the word as it relates to God's eternal purpose, as it relates to the, the, uh, the paradigm of the bride, of overcoming sons, of uh, uh, so many other uh, issues that are necessary as forerunners become a voice into the church and into the system, into the culture, uh, into the governmental systems, into intercession and all of the various things that are take place there. And so God wants to feed you the meat of the word. He wants to feed you uh, with revelation knowledge. He wants to give you revelation knowledge that will prepare you and equip you to be a voice. So he wants to work on your character, but he also to, to cut away the old, to draw you closer to him, those things that would hinder a deeper, closer relationship. And he wants to feed you the word. Now, a lot of that just be fed the word draws you closer to God as well, but it also gives you the message. It also gives you the, 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 the topics and the subject matter so that as you are a voice, you can be effective uh, in uh, that voice. Um, Another personal illustration of my own time at Brook Cherith. When, when God had taken me outside the camp and was doing that deep work uh, in me, uh, I, there's that uh, line from, uh, one, I forgot the name of the book now, but it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. And that was probably how I would characterize my time at Brook Cherith. It was the worst of times in that nothing good was happening uh, in my ministry life. Nothing really of any significance. It was, uh, was kind of during the time of some of the revivals that were taking place in the 90s and people were being uh, really used of God and touched and things were happening in their churches and I was just being broken. Uh, so in that sense, it was the worst of times. But the revelation that God was giving to me during, the, in my, during my private time with him was just amazing. It was unbelievable. I mean, you know, I'm sure you've had times like that too, but it was like just thank God were, was opening up the word, the scriptures to me in type and shadow form and in other ways, in a way that I had never had it happen before or since really. And God, what God was doing was that he was feeding me. I didn't realize this at the time, but he was feeding me from heaven, divine revelation that would not only give me the joy of a relationship with him that I could not live without ever, ever again, but it was also giving me the message, giving me the message that I would ultimately speak as a forerunner. And so the Lord wants to take you through that time where he feeds you from heaven, bread and meat, of the scriptures and of his voice to equip you, draw him, you closer to him in relationship, intimate relationship, but also to give you that message. And so that's the purpose, that's the, uh, one of the, uh, the second purpose of uh, the time at Brook Cherith. So here's, 
here's what we, Brooke Cherith is important because we're going to move on to Zarephath here in just a minute. Brooke Cherith, God cuts away. He wants to cut away a lot of the things that would bind you and hinder you. And he wants to feed you to, to draw you closer to him, but to also give you the message of a forerunner. Now that's going to take a while. It's not going to happen in 30 days or 60 days. It's going to be a season of that, but it is worth it. It is worth it. It will be worth it. So I want to encourage you to, to say, Lord, take me there uh, into that season that you want me to be there. Okay, so now again, let's go back to 1 Kings 17. Um, we'll pick up with verse 7. Remember, he was at Brook Cherith. In verse 7, it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. And so he arose and he went to Zarephath. Um, and the rest of it we, won't, we don't need for what, the point we want to make. So the brook dried up. In other words, his season <coughs> at Brook Cherith had ended. Uh, and now he was sending him uh, to Zarephath. Now, a couple of things about Zarephath. One, the word Zarephath means refinement, refinement. So he had separated him and cut away and fed him at Brook Cherith. And now he was going to refine his character, really. Refine his character. Zarephath uh, means refinement. Now, it said there in that passage that Zarephath was a place in Sidon. Now, Sidon was a town, but it was all, and it was really, uh, really close, eight kilometers, I think, from Zarephath. But Sidon was also a region. Jezebel's, listen to this now, Jezebel's father was the king of Sidon, and he was also a high pri or priest of Baal. And so most likely Jezebel was a priestess of Asherah, uh, which is the, which when she married Ahab, that's the religion that she was trying to push into the land of the northern kingdom of Israel. And so we have Ahab and Jezebel pushing Baal worship uh, and Asherah. Now, Elijah was going to have to confront that. Elijah, when Elijah went back, that was going to be his assignment. Uh, uh, confront uh, Baal and Asherah, the prophets of those, so that the people will turn back to Yahweh, the true worship of Yahweh. So what did God do? God said, okay, I'm going to prepare you to do that. And the way I'm going to prepare you to do it is I'm going to send you to the headquarters, if, if you will, of Baal and Asherah worship in the land. I'm going to send you to that place where all the vices of Baal and Asherah worship were practiced. And what I want you to do is I want you to live there uh, with a widow in humble surroundings and not get involved in it. In other words, I'm going to refine you and I'm going to produce an overcoming, an overcoming character uh, that will make you ready so that you can be used as my voice going back into this environment that I'm going to send you back into. And so there's a principle there that just like God did with Elijah, he wants to do it with us. He wants to take us not literally into a, a, a temple of Baal or whatever, but he wants to put us in a situation where we can learn to overcome uh, the demonic entities or the issues that we will later be a voice into. Uh, specifically Jezebel, which we'll talk about that in a minute, but in a general sense as well uh, as uh, that. So that's what God's purpose is for us as he takes us to a spiritual Zarephath to produce us as an overcomer. There are two purposes here. Now there are two purposes that God has for us and he had for Elijah, but he had for us as well when we go to Zarephath. The first one is to develop the character of an overcomer. Remember we talked about union being an issue of intimacy and image. Well, image is when we take on the image of Christ and we have to be an overcomer uh, in order to be, to have to take on that, 
uh, image of Christ. So it's one purpose is to develop the character of an overcomer. Uh, but uh, there's a second purpose of that, and that is to build authority uh, for the forerunner ministry for what will later be used to overcome. Um, so let's talk, uh, let's talk about that. Um, let me talk a little bit about the character part of it first. Uh, you know, when you look at how we're conformed into the image of Christ, you, when you read the, the, the messages of Paul, the letters of Paul, he talks a lot about the cross, about embracing the cross, going to the cross, dying to sin, dying to self, uh, dying to the, all of these issues. So, but he's talking about that as a process or a method of um, being uh, conformed into the image of Christ. Now, John used the idea of an overcomer. Uh, both are the same thing, in my opinion. Both are, you know, different, different nuances, but they both are, have the same objective is to produce the image of Christ uh, in a people. And so uh, let's, let's look at, with that kind of that basic understanding, let's look at Revelation uh, chapter 2. Now, if you look at the, the all, if you look at the messages to the church at Revelation, what you see is that you see that this whole idea of overcoming, uh, to he who overcomes, I will grant you this or that. Uh, and to most of those churches, some didn't have a call to overcome, but most of them had a, some sort of an issue that they had to overcome. And there was a promise associated with that. Uh, but so there's a message in all of these, but I want to read Thi the message to Thyatira, or Thyatira um, because it does something a little bit different. It talks first about Jezebel, overcoming Jezebel specifically. And secondly, it connects that if you overcome Jezebel, that God will grant you authority in the nation. So uh, let me just read this, starting with Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, and to the angels of the church in, in Thyatira, write this. The Son of God, who has eyes like flames of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this. I know your deeds and your love and your faith and your service and your perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you. This is what he had against them. That you tolerate the woman Jezebel. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and they eat things sacrificed to idols. In other words, she leads them into all sorts of uh, uh, immoral and corrupt activities. And I gave her time to repent and she did not want to repent of her immorality. And so I bold, I will, behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation, into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Um, but I say to you, the rest who are not who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. And he who overcomes, and here's what I want you to hear now, next. And he who overcomes, and he's speaking specifically about Jezebel uh, in this context, but I think there's a general principle here. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds into the end to him I will give authority over the nations. I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken in pieces as I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He owes an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. I know it's kind of a long thing there, but uh, here's the principle. What you overcome, you give authority, you get authority over. Uh, very important principle. Now, I understand that he's talking about, a uh, for the primary, he's talking about authority in the ages to come. Uh, and that's a big part of that. But the principle is that, is that for now as well. If we overcome, we grant authority. 
Uh, and specifically, he used that in the context of Jezebel. Now, it wasn't the same Jezebel that, that Elijah fought, but it was the same, I believe it was one with the same type of issues, same type of tentacles and uh, manifestations and was doing the same thing that the Jezebel of Elijah battle was trying to do back then, those hundreds of years before that. And so here's the principle that you have to overcome Jezebel and overcome the issues. And all, most of these seven churches had different issues they had to overcome in order to have authority. And so there was two purposes that God took Elijah to and wants to take us to, to our Zarephath. He wants to take us into situations where we have to overcome those situations. Uh, we have to learn to overcome. Now, not all of them are Jezebel, but we have to overcome in those situations. And as we overcome, we are conformed more and more into the image of Christ by overcoming. And we are also granted authority, greater authority uh, as a voice into those issues that we have overcome. And so God wants to take you uh, into your own Zarephath uh, for that. Um, he wants to produce that inward work that pr produces Christ's likeness and also uh, produces authority. Um, the next point, and I'm, I want to come back to what I've said here, but I want to just mention this point. In addition to growing as an overcomer, our time of preparation is to train our hands to war. He wants to train our hands to war during that work. It's to produce something in us, it's to grant us authority, but it's also to teach us uh, how to war. Now there's several scriptures there. Uh, you know, if you look at Isaiah 42, verse 13, we see that God is a warrior. Uh, and then if we look at Psalm 18, he wants to train our hands uh, for war uh, as well. Uh, the scriptures were silent on how Elijah was, was trained, how God trained him. But we know that he was because when he went back, what did he do? He battled the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. He called on God and it was a spiritual uh, encounter, spiritual battle of spiritual warfare. Uh, so we don't know exactly how God trained Elijah, but let me just use this as an illustration of how God has trained my hands uh, to war. Uh, and he's still training them to war. Uh, so he's, he's producing, you know, at Zarephath, he's producing character, he's producing authority, but he's also training uh, my hands to be able to war there. And he will do the same with you. And the way he did it with us, my wife and I, is he put situations in our lives that we had to fight in order to survive. Uh, not the most pleasant way to learn how to fight, but it was, it was effective. Uh, when we, right at the beginning, even a little bit before the beginning of the forerunner call, uh, the enemy, I won't go into details, but the enemy put a satanic plant uh, into our life and into our church uh, that was trying to destroy the ministry completely and probably, in fact, destroy my wife and I and others uh, in our fellowship. And so we had to learn to battle that. And we battled it not so that we could be an effective forerunner. We just didn't want to get killed. We didn't want to die. We didn't want to be destroyed by that. And I won't go through all the details of it, but it was an intense battle. And, and, uh, we battled, and it didn't last just a day or two. It was several weeks, months that we had to fight through all of this. And it was a very difficult, difficult situation uh, but we did learn to pray. We did, God did teach us more and more about spiritual warfare and prayer uh, and how to go about it through that encounter. And ultimately it went away and we were, haven't, for decades, haven't heard anything about it or whatever since then. But and then there was another situation. This one was specifically related to the spirit of Jezebel. There was a lady who had come into our church who was... Uh, very much Jezebelic in her nature. And I didn't know much about it at the time. So God was beginning to teach me about all about the spirit of Jezebel. Because remember, Jezebel, her assignment was to, to attack Elijah. Uh, and so if you're going to be a forerunner, uh, you got to learn 
to fight this spirit, the tentacles of this spirit of Jezebel. Uh, and so, anyway, the long story, but it came to a confrontation. She left, probably two-thirds of our church left with her, or God, not only left with her, but God removed probably two-thirds of our church as a result of that. But that didn't end the story. I mean, we were depressed about that and felt hopeless and not really not knowing what to do. But that didn't end the story. All right, uh, we're back. We had a little bit of a uh, issue with our microphone, but we're back. Uh, it's interesting uh, that as we were talking about Jezebel, uh, the mic went out, so we had to replace some uh, stuff, get that going uh, again. And uh, we, that happens a lot with us, we do that. But anyway, back to the story. The, the lady had left, who, who had the strong Jezebelic character. She had left, but several of the people who were at our church went with her to this prayer group, and they were praying for us, supposedly. But what it was doing was it was releasing a tremendous amount of witchcraft, soulish prayers, directional prayers, uh, charismatic curses of witchcraft kind of a thing. Uh, and so what the Lord used that to do, though, was to train my wife and myself, our hands to war, this time specifically against the spirit of Jezebel. Uh, and so uh, we learned to war against that by fighting against that, not against the people, but against the spirit, not against the flesh and blood, but the spirit uh, that was there. And so God used it. It was not a very pleasant uh, time. In fact, it was a very unpleasant time for quite a while, but God used it to train us to be warriors against uh, that spirit. And so that's the point of, of our time at Zarephath. Uh, it, it, our, that's the point of our time at Zarephath is to produce character in us into the image of Christ, to train our hands to war and to give us authority uh, so that when we go as a voice, now, I'm not saying you have to come against principalities. Please hear me there. Uh, in fact, our, our foreigner school class, uh, an eternal purpose house of prayer, deals a lot with that. Uh, but if you're going to be a voice, there's an authority you need. There's, a, there's character you need, and there's an anointing that you need. You need to be a warrior to be able to do that, to be strong uh, in those things. And so... God will use your time at Zarephath to do that. Now, this is an interesting uh, verse. We'll go back to 1 Kings 17. Uh, you know, all of the chapter there is about Elijah's time outside the camp. Uh, you know, 18.1 starts with this. Now, it came about after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the earth. Okay, so you know, at 18.1, he's going back into the land to, to his con time of confrontation. But look at the last verse of chapter 17, uh, 17.24. This is the woman that he was uh, staying with uh, at, uh, at Zarephath. The woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Two things, she said. Isn't this, isn't this good? I know that your character, I know that you are truly a man of God. God had done a work uh, in him over that period of time where, God, where he, people, external, pagans, knew that he was a man of God, knew his character, and what else? And that the word in your mouth is truth. God had put that word of scripture in his mouth, the revelation on. And that's what he wants to do uh, with you uh, as well. Now, one more verse before we move on uh, to ministry. First Thessalonians, we used this before, but I want to just go back to it again. First Thessalonians chapter two. Really, you could read the whole chapter, uh, but this is talking about uh, Paul. 
Uh, and I'll just start with verse 3. Paul said, our exhortation, Paul's exhortation, does not come from error. See, God had corrected the, any error in his, in his theology, gave him a, a truth in his message, or impurity, had done a work in, in, in his character to produce purity in his character, a way of deceit, he had purified his motives for ministry, uh, but just as we have been approved. And so, you know, he was called, he took him into the wilderness to do all these things, and, and that was, there was an approval process that was going on there. Uh, we're approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. In other words, he was commissioned there to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak, not pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. And that's what he wants to do in us. He wants to call us uh, outside the camp with all these things we've talked about to make us where we can be approved of God to be entrusted with the message uh, that God has for us. Um, very important that we submit to that uh, time of preparation to truly be a voice of the Lord. Okay, now let's shift gears a little bit from preparation to ministry. And this will be the last topic, although it will take a little bit of time to, to discuss this. Uh, the ministry journey uh, of the forerunner. If we look at the life of Elijah, we, look, we find uh, essentially five major or primary areas of ministry that he engaged in and that we as forerunners, end time forerunners will engage in too. Now I just wanna go through these fairly quickly because we've talked about really all of these already, but I wanna put them in, a, uh, in kind of a succinct uh, place uh, in just a, in one moment of time sort of thing. But also it kind of portrays an order uh, that Elijah ministered and this order pretty much parallels the order that the Lord used in me. And I'll end, kind of end with that in a minute. But it may be the order he uses, he un opens up the forerunner ministry to you as well. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit uh, about that. Uh, so let's look at these five things real quickly. First, uh, Elijah functioned as a messenger speaking to the people of God, calling them to turn back to God. Remember he said, if, if Yahweh is God, follow him. You know, he was a messenger calling on them to repent and to turn back to God. That was the first way that God used him uh, after he came back from his time of preparation was to call the people back to God. Second, his second area of ministry, Elijah rebuilt the altar to Yahweh that had been torn down. So that was kind of like the master builder role where he had spoken to the people come back, but before he confronted the, the prophets of Baal and Asherah, he rebuilt the altar because it was on that rebuilt altar that fire came from heaven in response to his prayers uh, to turn the people, to awaken the people that they might turn back to God. That was the second area. The third area that Elijah called on God to defeat the prophets of Baal and Asherah, and he also prayed for rain to come. Now, this is important. You know, we, uh, Elijah didn't prophesy directly, in this case, directly to the prophets of Baal or the prophets of Asherah. He asked God to bring fire down to consume the sacrifice and to show the superiority of Yahweh over Baal and Asherah. But his focus was to God. But it, so he did that in, in a mode of spiritual warfare in the confrontation with the prophets of Baal and Asherah. But he also later called for rain. So that was a birthing kind of a thing. And both are true as forerunners. The confrontational kind of spiritual warfare, again, focused on, toward God, not toward principalities. Uh, and the, the birthing of the rain. And so uh, we see him functioning as a warrior and as an intercessor. Um, fourth, Elijah also spoke directly into the anti-God government and the anti-God culture. Now, uh, it'd be an interesting study. We don't have time to talk about it here. But if you look at 1 Kings chapter 21, 
uh, starting with about 17, I guess, or somewhere in there, where uh, Ahab and Jezebel stole Naboth's vineyard. They kill, had him killed, they stole it, uh, and they took it for themselves. A picture of our, uh, the, uh, the, our inheritance in Christ. They took it, and so as a result of that, God sent Elijah to speak to Ahab, uh, and he prophesied the destruction of the entire line of Ahab and of Jezebel. Now here, okay, the, the point I want you to see here is here he was not calling on, if we take it in the New Testament, he was not calling on the church to turn. He was not praying to God uh, to send fire. He was speaking directly into a situation and an issue uh, where the people were against and opposed to the purposes of God. And so there will be times when God will send you to speak into a situation. Uh, uh, you know, the, if we take it in type and shadow form here, uh, Ahab represents the Antichrist system, governmental system, and Jezebel represents the Jezebelic culture, immoral Babylonian culture. Both permeate the earth right now. And there will be times when God will send you into a situation and he'll say, speak into that situation. Now, I'm not saying he's going to send you to the, uh, to the president of your nation or the king or whatever, whoever it might be, or the prime minister or whatever. I'm not saying he'll do that, but he will at times send you to speak into a person calling on them uh, to turn or whatever might be might happen. In fact, Ahab did turn, and he didn't. Uh, he died another way. But his whole, when Jehu came on the scene, he destroyed Jezebel and he wiped out the entire line of Ahab. And so you can. It's a pretty interesting, very interesting study as you look at uh, Elijah, Ahab, Jezebel, Elisha, Jehu, and all that took place there in First and Second Kings. But we don't have time for it. Here, so uh, anyway, that um, that would be the fourth area, and then the fifth area. Remember, there were five areas. Is that he raised up spiritual sons? Elijah raised up spiritual sons. We know he raised up Elisha, but there were also sons of the prophet. Kind of a training school uh, that he did um, to raise up his successors, uh, and so. The point is that, you know, if you will prepare yourself outside the camp at Brook Cherith and at Zarephath, uh, you, you, God will use you uh, in one or more of these five areas, maybe all of them. Now, not everybody will be used in all five areas. Uh, some may only be used in one or two or three or whatever. But you may, God may use you in all five of those dimensions of the forerunner call. So prepare yourself and allow him to lead you uh, in those things. Okay, one more section, section that we have, and this will conclude the session and the class, and it's entitled Called, Commissioned, and Appointed. Um, so it, it just, uh, there's several scriptures in the notes here, uh, but if you look at doing a concordant search on a point or appointed, we see that, that it's pretty throughout the New Testament. They had appointed elders in every church, uh, and God had appointed in the church, second another verse, God had appointed in the church first apostles, prophets, teachers, etc. And another verse, Paul saying this, For this I was appointed as a preacher and an apostle, I'm telling you the truth, I'm not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And so what do we see? We see the whole topic of being appointed. Now, here's what I, the way I distinguish between called, commissioned, and appointed. And, and there is a very specific difference here. And I want to apply it to forerunners. Okay, we're called as a forerunner. Uh, we've talked about that. We go out in the time of preparation. At the end of that, we've been approved and we are commissioned. Now, the commissioning as a forerunner is essentially a general approval by God that you are now ready uh, to carry the message of the forerunner. But God has done sufficiency in your relationship with him. 
He's done, he's conformed your character sufficiently. Uh, and uh, he has uh, said you've been approved to now uh, to take the message out wherever he may lead you. Okay, that's, that's kind of a general uh, approval process. But there's an issue of an appointment where appointment is in a specific uh, function or a specific place for a specific time and season. Uh, and this is important because God has commissioned you, but, and you may be appointed, and he will appoint you to do something for a season. But that appointment may change. Now, he won't necessarily change your commissioning as a forerunner, but what he might do is give you a different assignment in a different time, in a different season. And so all three of those dimensions are important. We need to say yes to the call to, and we need to be prepared. We need to be approved so that we can be commissioned as a forerunner. But we have to really pay close attention to the appointment that God has given to us in, uh, in times uh, and seasons. Let me just use uh, my, own, my own personal journey as a, just to kind of conclude the, the session and the class uh, to talk about how different times and season God has appointed me in different things. And as you walk in this, uh, there will most likely be different appointments, different times and seasons where he wants you to do things uh, differently. Uh, the Lord took my wife, uh, you know, after we were in an intense season, uh, he launched us into the forerunner ministry. Uh, and my first assignment was to my church, the local church, to be a forerunner to my local church. And, I, and we were faithful at that. We taught on the broad. We taught on a lot of different issues for a lot of times, for a long period of time. Uh, and so then there came a time, he didn't necessarily, he, in this case, our case, he didn't take us away from the local church, but he opened up a forerunner ministry beyond the walls of our local church. He began to send me to the nations, not necessarily in a systematic way, but just going to the nations. And whenever I went, I would teach on forerunner types of messages. Now, they were only in the beginning form of that at that point in time, but he had given me another assignment to travel to the nations. And so we did that for a, for a number of years, but there wasn't really a systematic uh, process involved at that point uh, in time. And so then there came a time after that, where we realized, I need to be more systematic in this if we're going to really make impact. And so we began to do pastor's conferences uh, then, and uh, predominantly at this point, we started out Africa and India, but now kind of focused on Africa. And we were going and we were doing pastor's conferences, and we would take a life school class, and we would teach it for three or four days. We would teach all day long. We would teach session after session after session, uh, of a life school class uh, to the pastors. And they were, these were forerunner types uh, of messages. And so God had appointed us for a season to do this. But then there came a point where we realized this is not accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish. And so that's when we started the distance learning aspect of the life school program where we were able to penetrate into a lot more pastors and hopefully in a lot more lasting uh, impact upon them. So we did that for a while and still are doing that, in fact. Uh, but then at the end of last year, the Lord spoke to me really, really, really clearly and said, I want you to be a Zacharias and an Elizabeth, my wife to be Elizabeth and me to be a Zacharias. And what I want you to do is birth John the Baptist. I want you to birth forerunners. Uh, and so another appointment, another assignment to do this. Uh, and so that's when we started the Forerunner School. You know, with a lot of prayer and waiting on the Lord, he began to speak to us and said, the way you do this is I want you to start a Forerunner School that'll be somewhat different from the life school materials and make it available not only to pastors, but also to uh, believers in a general uh, in a general sense in which we've done that. And we started it in September. And this is the first class uh, of that. Uh, and so the point, the reason I'm bringing all that up is we might be in different places in our journey as a forerunner. 
There's that preparation and there's journey, that journey of ministry. When you're called and you're prepared, God will commission you because he wants you to be a forerunner probably more than you want it yourself. He will commission you and he, you'll be amazed at what, he, what doors he can open up to you, doors that you cannot open up yourself in any way. Uh, he will commission you and he will use you in that. And even as you mature uh, in your ministry as a forerunner, God will open up different assignments, different appointments. Some may just be for a season. Some may change everything uh, forever. Only God can tell you, and it, it'll be different for you than it was for me. But I want you to be open to that. I want you to say, Lord, I'm a, I, want, I say yes to the forerunner call. I say yes to the preparation. I, I say yes to being commissioned by you. And I say yes to whatever appointments you want for me. I'm here for you, Lord. I am here for you. I want, that's kind of the attitude that I hope and pray will you, God will put into your heart and you will be amazed. Again, go back to that phrase we used from that movie, The Field of Dreams. Build it and they will come. If you will build your life around this, God will come to you and he will equip you and lead you to ways where, you will be a, where, where he does exceedingly abundant things in you and through you. So as we conclude this session and also conclude this class, I say, let us understand the forerunner call. Let us say yes to it. Let us devote uh, complete surrender to it like Elisha when he left his field and, and ministered and served Elijah. Let us be made ready to be used as a voice, messenger, builder, intercessor, friends of the bridegroom for the Lord. He will be pleased with you if you do it, if God is calling you in such a way. So, Father, we pray, let it be so, Lord, in each and every one of us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.